not, I'm not doing video. You're not doing video? <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, because that was gonna make it slightly awkward. <laughs> uh, even though my accent, but you know, <laughs> that, that will never change. <laughs> but, uh... Today, we're getting to know Emmy-nominated American photojournalist Ron Hubbard. Ron has spent his career documenting conflict and post-conflict areas for magazines around the world and is the co-founder of the photo agency Seven. Ron is the central character in six documentary films where he speaks about the dangers of combat photography, including his numerous detentions and close calls. Hello, Ron. It is a pleasure to have you in, in this channel. I always admire your work, but more particularly your down-to-earth persona. So thank you for accepting this invitation. Thanks, KK. Great to be here. And, and before I start, I want to thank you for bringing the books of the Adventures of Pili to Rwanda. That was that was very kind of you. No, it was my pleasure. And actually, you know, it was really It was, it was so lovely to see the reactions of the children, the school children, as they got the books and I got to see them spend some time with the teacher and going over it. So congratulations on that project and all the success to getting it around the world. Well, I want to thank you because I think you were one of the first supporters. So, so that was pretty cool. And a few months ago, the whole world had their eyes on, on the Capitol Hill mob. And when I look at some of the photographs, I saw your name. And the first question that crossed my mind is how did Ron get there. Would you mind sharing the experience and some of recollection of, of the events with us? Well, I mean, the year 20, 2020 going into 2021, you know, with COVID and so on, it was very limited on the ability to travel and document what was happening around the world. So my focus became very inward. And so I spent a lot of time, especially in 2020, documenting the effects of the presidency of President Trump. Uh, the groups that kind of came out to support him, such as the Proud Boys, interactions and protests, conflicts with Antifa, the left wing side, and kind of where this country was. And by once the election happened, the president lost the election. Every kind of step was almost very easy to determine this is going to happen next. And January 6th, they called for a demonstration. The president was going to come out and speak. So It was kind of the, the last time, the last attempt that they would have to try to change the election results is the U.S. Congress was certifying the election. So that was the place to be. And the president came out and spoke and basically rallied everybody up to go to the Capitol. And off I went with the crowd towards the Capitol and wound up uh, climbing through a broken window with everybody else and found myself inside the Capitol as they kind of battled their way for a few hours trying to make a statement or really whatever they were trying to do. They didn't really accomplish much. They did delay the vote and certification, but they certainly set um, an example of a symbol of where the United States is at this particular moment. And uh, would you mind sharing some anecdotes that, that you experienced during the process or, or some personal impressions that went through your mind when you were actually clicking the camera? Well, I think it was, uh, there were a number of different things that we had to deal with myself and many of my colleagues. One was the president during his speech made sure that everybody knew that the media was the enemy. So constantly being vigilant on wondering if we were going to be attacked uh, by the protesters. A number of my colleagues were, were beaten and hurt and so on. I was lucky enough not to be. The other issue to be constantly worried about was COVID. Many of the people didn't have masks. Although once the tear gas started, that actually helped because everybody then put on masks, made it a little bit safer. So you had to worry about getting COVID and a number of my colleagues got COVID after documenting um, the events of that day. And then it became incredibly surreal. You know, these very strange situations where in some places people were just simply chanting slogans and other places they were using bare mace to, to attack Uh, the police officers in other places, the police were completely outnumbered and running away. In other places, um, 
you turn a corner once I was inside the building and there was a guy dressed up as a giant panda. Why? Who knows? Some comment about China policies? I have no idea. And kind of wandering around the halls with these guys who were either looking for the offices of the senators and Congress people that they hated, or they were looking for the bathroom. Uh, you know, it was this kind of very like weird, weird situation. And then you had these people, you know, very famous guy who became well known, photographed by many people. This, this guy known as the shaman, wearing um, fur and a, a helmet with horns and bare chested. And I followed him uh, into the, into the building and how he interacted with the police. And you know, at times it really seemed like you were part of a part of a movie. It was very very odd. And when you're actually photographing the bit different events, were people willing to be photographed? Did you find constant confrontation? Did they ignore you? People were happy with with events and willing to pose. What was how 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 do you experience the, the personal process in terms of approaching oh. the photo opportunities? First of all, pretty much everybody had a, a at least a uh, phone with the camera. So people were filming each other all over the place. So it was like it was probably one of the most documented riots, uprising, protests, however you want to frame it. Um, so having a camera was not totally unusual. I travel with uh, very small Fuji mirrorless cameras uh, versus kind of some of the other photographers who were kind of much more decked out with bigger cameras who got harassed. So I think I just blended in personally. And I think people were either so involved with what they were doing, uh, were, were not paying attention to me, or when I felt like maybe eyes were turned, turning towards me, I kind of sort of moved away as quickly uh, as, as possible. So I was lucky in terms of harassment um, and so on. I was able to work, but it was also, you know, it was difficult to understand exactly what was happening, how violent it would get, And while it was violent, it certainly was not as violent as it possibly could have gotten. The Capitol Police never opened up fire with guns. The protesters that did have guns didn't use them. So while people were beaten, some people were killed, uh, it was, um, given what was happening, I think it could have been a lot more violent. And how do you handle security when you're on assignment in conflict areas or post-conflict areas? What have you learned over the years to make your work the safest possible, despite the working environment? Well, I think what, what, start, what came about in the 1990s, uh, especially from the war in the former Yugoslavia, were that more and more journalists were being killed and wounded because I had no idea what they were doing in a war zone, including myself. I started working in, in war zones within a few months of being a photographer with no real understanding of what to do here, what to do there, following um, people that were sort of mentoring me and, and trying to follow more experienced photographers. But nobody really had been understood what it was like to be under battle and getting bombed by airplanes or helicopters or things like that. And so by the time probably 1992, 1993 rolled around, this uh, idea of training journalists to survive war, especially with medical training, came about these hostile environment forces came about. I took my first class in 1995. And there you learned from most like most of the classes were offered by British Special Forces, ex-British Special Forces, who were training and they would teach you how to differentiate between incoming and outgoing, how to stop bullet wounds, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this, I think, saved many, many lives. And to this day, it is a, a crucial part of any training so, is to go to these classes And then in situations like, let's say, Afghanistan today or Iraq or Syria and so on, uh, bigger organizations are able to hire these guys also as consultants in the field because everybody is incredibly aware today of the power of the image and yeah. wants to control it. So you need to understand what you're doing and you need to have protection. And I'm not saying that a photographer needs to be armed with a weapon, but certainly needs to be armed with the knowledge of what to do. Do photographs always tell the truth? Or can a photograph lie? Photographs, of course, can lie. And photographs are should never be referred to as some sort of objective view of the situation. It's incredibly subject. You are looking at my choice, my frame, 250th of a second of time. I'm choosing to show you this. 
What's important is who I am, the publication I'm giving you the work through, that we are representing the situation correctly, that we have integrity, that we are doing things within the ethics of journalism. This is a constant uh, conversation today, this idea about media literacy and how do you consume news and imagery and so on. So you have to be able to trust uh, who you're looking for. But you as a viewer, you as a consumer of images, need to look at a variety of different publications and different images to really truly understand uh, what you're looking at. So you look at my view, you look at the person who's standing to my left, you look at the person who's down the street, and by combining all of that, you have the ability to then truly understand the situation. Uh, how do you control your mind and your emotions when you're working on the field? I imagine experiencing like an internal roller coaster from anger to fear and, and everything in between. Is, is there a secret? I, I think everybody has their own formula. I mean, for me, I think it's incredibly important to recognize in these conflict areas that I am fearful from that moment the plane leaves uh, my home to the time I return back. But the, the key is to use that fear to your advantage, to basically protect you, to make sure that, or at least I try to make sure that I don't do things that are too risky with the understanding, obviously I'm in a risky situation, but there are certain limits that I'm not willing to pass. I'm not willing or want to die for a photograph, but I will try to do my best to get a photograph to tell the story. So, I'm, I'm, one, well, let me just finish. You just you want to make sure that the fear doesn't overwhelm you to the point that you can't work, and there's no point in being there. At the same time, you want the fear to protect you that you're not taking unnecessary risks. And have you experienced some kind of post-traumatic syndrome after working on different locations? And when you go back home, everything sinks down and you react to it? Absolutely. I think especially in the beginning of my career when PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, was somewhat of a stigma, was not well, well thought of. Uh, you have the kind of cliché vision of the war correspondent uh, who's drunk all the time or taking drugs, can't cope with what, what they've seen in the field. Um, there's been a real movement to try to stop that through the uh, DART Society, through the Ockberg Center, there where people are trying to ensure that when a journalist comes back from a conflict area, and it could be just dealing with something traumatic, covering a family suffering from COVID or documenting an ambulance crew or something like that, that there's proper um, proper questions to ask, how are you feeling and so on, and, and, and paying attention. And so today it's very different than when I started where people are really much more conscious of it. There are doctors, professionals that specialize in this. Uh, and you know, there's a doctor, Anthony Feinstein, who did a study on the ratio of PTSD between war correspondents and soldiers and found that it was very similar. So it's a real issue. But it's an issue now that is no longer one hidden in the closet and something that's important for all of us to accept and, and to deal with. Please, what is war and conflict photography? Well, that's a really, uh, it's a big question, a small, small question. There are lots of different ways to, to answer that. I think, you know, obviously when we think about war or conflict, we immediately think about guns, often, you know, men versus man, man versus man and so on. But Reality, conflict, and, and, and war, and what the photography tries to do is really document the impact from the person with the gun to the family, to the civilians, to the government, society, culture, all the different things that are affected when, it, when places break apart in violence. And it could be full out war, could be an invasion, civil war, can be urban, urban uh, fighting, riots, protests. All sorts of different things. I think when you kind of, for me, that's a very sort of broad genre, broad title. But basically what it is is really it's humanity against humanity and the breaking part of, of, of normal normal life. And I'm sure you've already been asked this before, but from all the things you can do with a camera, why conflict photography? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, I had an opportunity, especially in the beginning, as I was learning to be a photographer. Should I be a fashion photographer? Should I be a photojournalist? And I still think to this day, you know, maybe I should have done the photographing the beautiful people and having the great meals and flying around <laughs> first class versus uh, 
you know, not making any money and um, not really photographing uh, beautiful people, but but actually photographing photographing reality in life. And I think in action, yeah, no, I, I did make the right choice. I've, I've been this in this position to witness history unfold in front of me, and quite often uh, it happens out of conflict. And watching countries born, countries die, incredible momentous occasions that affect the future of that population and being able to document that and bring it or bring my vision to the world. It's actually been an incredible privilege. It's pretty been pretty fantastic. And I've been doing this now for more than 30 years. And what do you know now you didn't know then? It's a constant experience of, of learning. I think there's no kind of like, oh, it's step one, I didn't do this, or step five, I did this, but didn't do that. It's just, I'm learning about the way the world works. I'm learning about different cultures. I'm learning about myself and how I interpret things. And I think it's, just, it's, it's a constant growing experience. And I think you watch, hopefully you can see my photography becoming better over the decades and becoming more informative, more influential, more intriguing, uh, more of an item for people to interact with and, and, lear and learn from. Do photographs always tell the truth or can a photograph lie? Photographs, of course, can lie. And photographs are should never be referred to as some sort of objective view of the situation. It's incredibly subject. You are looking at my choice, my frame, 250th of a second of time, I am choosing to show you this. What's important is who I am, the publication I'm giving you the work through, that we are representing the situation correctly, that we have integrity, that we are doing things within the ethics of journalism. This is a constant uh, conversation today, this idea about media literacy and how do you consume news and imagery and so on. So you have to be able to trust uh, who you're looking for. But you as a viewer, you as a consumer of images, need to look at a variety of different publications and different images to really truly understand uh, what you're looking at. So you look at my view, you look at the person who's standing to my left, you look at the person who's down the street, and by combining all of that, you have the ability to then truly understand the situation. And I'm sure that working in these environments is not easy. Uh, how do you control your mind and your emotions? I said that from that attack, actually they, they burn different villages, some villages this way, villages this way, and, and several people were killed. We tried to run away, but we couldn't. He chased me and he shouted that if he catch me, he killed me. They say, kill what you want to kill. And I would like to hear the stories behind three of your images. Uh, I'm going to put them on, on the screen while you while you share your your thoughts. The first one that we can see here on the screen is the displaced Darfuri girls. Uh, can you tell me what was happening, thoughts, emotion, anything you want to share regarding this particular photograph? Well, uh, when I went to Darfur, uh, the civil war had been going on. Um, for several years, it eventually became uh, called a genocide by the United Nations. And I really was interested in, in seeing whether or not the conflict would spill over into the next generation, into the children, where they would pick up arms uh, to fight uh, alongside their parents or to replace their parents. So I made a pitch to UNICEF uh, to go and do a project about the children of Darfur. And with the ability to move around as a, a UN uh, photographer, I was able to kind of cross lines and be able to see a lot of things that uh, many journalists were not able to see. And one day, very early in the morning, I was driving near a displacement camp in North Darfur and saw three little specks in the distance and we drove up to them. And it was these three, three young girls, probably aged between 10 and 12 years old. And we stopped and we're talking to them and asking where they were going because there was nothing around. There were no trees, there was no villages, they were just completely in the middle of nowhere. And they said they had been sent off by their parents to look for firewood uh, in order to bring back to the camp so that the parents would be able to cook food because there was no firewood anywhere nearby. And asking them how long it would take them, they said, oh, it could take up to a day, maybe longer. 
and I asked if they were afraid of being attacked by the Janjaweed, which was a Sudanese militia group. Uh, and they said, yes, they were afraid, and they had often uh, had encounters with them, but so far, luckily, had not been attacked. But there were many stories of young girls, as young as them, uh, being attacked and being raped. And when I asked uh, my uh, translator why their parents weren't uh, out there and why they had sent these young girls, they said, if the father had gone out and was caught by the Janjaweed, he would be killed immediately. If the mother had gone out, she would be, without question, raped and then possibly killed. So they send the children out in the hope that they're too young to be bothered by, by this group. And so as we were talking, the, the lead girl, the older girl, just kind of put her head down. Um, and the other two girls kind of hid behind her. And I took a couple of photographs of them. It looks like a posed photograph, but it was a very natural kind of moment. And we went back, back to talking. And the photograph yeah. um, became uh, kind of the uh, identifying photograph, not only for UNICEF with Darfur, but also Amnesty International. Um, it was part of an exhibition that we toured and we raised uh, a lot of money for, uh, for Darfur uh, with, with those photographs, which um, hopefully had some, some impact. Thank you for saying, Ron. The, the other photograph that I'm sure everybody has seen, uh, I recognize the uh, Panamanian vice president covering blood. I don't know if you recall, but I lived four years in Panama, so that's a place that I'm, I'm kind of connected to. I would like to know what was happening, and also if you can share the life of this photograph from the moment you capture it to all the impact that has had later on. Uh, you don't mind. Yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting journey for that photograph, especially it's for me. It was my first foreign trip. Uh, a colleague of mine, Chris Morris, gave me uh, an extra plane ticket to, to go with him after I lost my assignment. So I was there freelancing for AFP, uh, selling images $50 at a time uh, with a nice group of people documenting basically a very simple story where the dictator of Panama, General Manuel Noriega, had declared uh, that he was going to hold elections. He held elections, he lost the election, he nullified the result, and the would-be dictators came out onto the street uh, to basically start an uprising. And the people came onto the streets and there were clashes around and so on, and I wound up being um, in a situation with the vice president-elect, the, the one who um, actually won the election, um, he was uh, being attacked. His bodyguard, uh, Alexis Guerra, uh, laid on top of him uh, as somebody fired into the car, killing the bodyguard. And I um, kind of made my way towards the car. And as I did, the car door opened and this guy came stumbling out, covered in blood with a white guayabara. And I was like, it was very difficult to kind of recognize him at first. And I did. And it turned out he was the vice president. And as I did, I heard somebody say to me, come permiso. And I kind of moved aside, and the guy stepped around me and began to beat up uh, the vice president with, uh, with a wooden bar or, of some sort. He was a supporter of uh, Noriega, a group called the Digni Battalion. And I took a few photographs as uh, Ford fought back. And then uh, Ford was arrested and uh, disappeared, and I ran off to AFP to send the photographs. Well, do you uh, recall what was the particular location when you captured that moment? So we were in, a... yeah, we were in Santa Ana Plaza, okay. which was a, a nice little a little park. Uh, the beating was in front of a movie theater that had uh, playing a Sean Connery film and a, and, a, and a James Bond film, a double feature. And the photographs were on the front pages of newspapers around the world the next day, and then wound up on the cover of Time and Newsweek and U.S. News all in the same week, which was. I think the first time a photographer had done that, um, maybe since the Vietnam War, if, if, if ever. And that photograph then basically began its own own life and kind of lost control of it uh, very quickly. In fact, actually, I'm doing a documentary called Biography of a Photo, where myself and Lauren Walsh, who's my co-director, were looking at the life of this photograph and another photograph from Bosnia and how, over the last 30 years, what's happened to that photograph. And so immediately, in terms of Panama, that photograph became a rallying cry for the opposition. Mm -hmm. The Bush administration used it um, as 
a tool to try to get people to come on board to overthrow Noriega. And seven months later, when the United States invaded Panama, the president spoke about the invasion, used the photograph as one of the justifications for the invasion in his speech to the nation, which I think uh, is very rare, if not ever, where a photograph was used as a reason for a military intervention. And it wasn't whether or not I agreed with the intervention, but it was for me, it was a very big deal in the beginning of my career to understand the power, the power of photography. Absolutely. I want you to, to comment on that we can see now on the screen. I see two subjects kissing. Uh, can you tell us what was happening here in that moment in time? This is a photograph taken from the Croatian Civil War, part of the dissolution of Yugoslavia. It was taken in 1991, and the city of Vukovar uh, was under siege uh, for many months, uh, the longest siege since uh, Stalingrad. And I was able to go in with the Serbian forces as the city fell. And it was a pretty brutal situation. People had been living underground. They started to come up um, and were taken away as prisoners. There were summary executions on the streets and so on. And there was this cross um, in the middle of the town uh, that had been filled with shrapnel holes and bullet holes. And it was quite amazing because when you look at the detail of the cross, everything has a hole in it except for the body of Christ, which is completely untouched. And this photograph is depicting two Serbian paramilitaries embracing in their joy over the victory over this Croatian town. Wow. Powerful. Uh, what would you say is the purpose of war photography? I think there's there are several different purposes. The first one is the immediate idea of disseminating information about what is happening in the hope that there will be a reaction to that information. So it's part of a chain that the fact that I put out a photograph galvanize the population to say like, oh, we, if we can, are, we should do something about it or our government should do something about it or look what's happening. The politicians then to react and so on. And hopefully that there will be change immediately. However, now having documented three genocides in my career in 30 years, it's quite often that these photographs fail. Um, to garner any real immediate attention. But they continue to exist as a body of evidence. They continue to exist to hold people accountable, not only for the actions within the photographs themselves, but also for the inactions of the people that see the work, for the decide not to do anything. And that's incredibly important. Absolutely. And your job has taken you to document places that the common mortal never gets to see. And I hope I'm right, but I think I saw photographs that you took uh, for an article or story called Gold Fever. I think it was a Smithsonian magazine. So I want you to share us, uh, what do you learn about the mining um, in the Amazon? Um, what do you learn on that particular uh, assignment of what was happening or is still happening there? Well, it's still happening. And this is a very important project. So it was for, basically I was a subject myself and a writer was the subject of a documentary called River of Gold, which you can see online now. Uh, and that basically we went to, to document illegal gold mining in the Peruvian Amazon and the effect that it has, no matter where you live in the world, that each time a little bit of the Amazon is damaged, the air quality around the world gets worse, all sorts of different things are happening. And so we, it was very difficult to get access to these mines to really understand what was happening, all for the pursuit of, of profit, of, of gold. But you have these very large companies working illegally, and you have very small miners working illegally. And it's a real issue both um, in Panama, sorry, in Brazil, in Peru, and, and other places. And the idea is to make sure that you, um, as a consumer, when you put on your gold wedding band, do you know where your gold came from? Was it, was it mined? legally was in mind with the environment um, in con concern for the environment and so on. Because this is something that we all together um, can, can help. And so you can learn a lot more about, uh, about this project going to see the movie River of Gold or going to Amazon Aid 
which is the organization that produced the document. Absolutely. And navigating these environments is not easy because you're not particularly uh, well received. No. How, how do you handle access locations um, from start to finish? I mean, each situation is different trying to get access. One of the things that photographers have to do is gain people's trust, often in a very short amount of time. So you have to find kind of common bonding experiences, whether it's family or culture or something that you, you both appreciate and hold dear. When you're able to do that, all of a sudden doors start to open up in a, in a different way. So I've worked, whether it's been in the Amazon, former Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on, finding sort of common common bonds, common themes, common things that we both want to happen enables access to be able to work. People tend to ask is what it's in your bag. I would like to know what it's in Ron's camera bag today. Uh, how do you work? Which is your you know, gear of choice? The, it really, really depends on, on the uh, situation and what we're doing. But I think that certainly the idea of smaller is better. So I'm really very happy now to be working with uh, Fuji mirrorless cameras, the X-T4, the X-T3. Very small, super quiet. Lenses are small. I think being inconspicuous is really helpful. And there are also times when the only thing you can work with is an iPhone uh, because people understand phone photography because they have a phone and they don't look at you as some outsider if you're photographing them with the same tool that they use. So it's very situational. Uh, it really just depends if it's something very big or something where it's going to take a long time or the ability that you don't have to worry about being conspicuous. You can work uh, with other gear and there's protected gear, depending obviously on if it's a conflict or a non-conflict story and all sorts of different things. Um, just have to be adaptable and be able to work from situation to situation. What, what three advices would you give someone, maybe a younger aspiring photographer that wants to be working in conflict areas? What would you give? What would you tell them? Uh, the first thing would be, of course, is to take a hostile environment class. I, if I if I would find somebody in the field and they wanted to get into my car, my first question is, have you taken a class? If they haven't, I don't really want to have anything to do with it. So I want to make sure they understand what it's like to work in a war zone and they have been properly trained. So before you go off to Syria, Afghanistan, or whatever, take this class. There are um, many scholarships for freelance photographers uh, for free to be able to take these classes for free. You can go to Rory Peck, to ACOS, various other places. Also, especially the medical trauma, places like Risk and other places are giving classes free uh, for freelance photographers. So that would be, without question, the first thing. The second one would be to make sure that you understand what you're doing. Why are you going? What are you trying to say? What are you going to do that's different than what's been done before? That's also very important. Uh, and the third thing is, I think, to you know, know, know yourself. You need to listen to yourself and not follow the pack. Because especially in terms of conflict, and I'll use an example from Libya, a very difficult one, where there was a group of photographers traveling near a front line. Uh, I think at least five or six photographers and a shell landed and two of them uh, were killed, two were injured and others survived. Just random blind luck. So, you know, know when you want, where you want, want to go, what you want to do and know that you have to go with your gut feeling. Just that's really important. And I would like to play a, a short game. It's very simple. I'm going to give you a short phrase or a word, and I want you to share any thoughts, experiences, memories that cross your mind. So don't think too much about it. And after you answer, if you can elaborate slightly, that would be, that would be wonderful. So my, my, my first uh, word or two words would be uh, Balkan War. Uh, destruction. Long, spending a long, long time there and something that was incredibly trans transformative both for my career and for myself as a person. And can you tell me a little bit more? So the, the idea is that you elaborate slightly more. Can you share any anecdotes? The, the Balkan breakup started in 1991 and ended in 2000. So over those 10 years, I spent more than five years on the ground documenting that. I documented the beginning. I was there in the end when the dictator or president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, was arrested 
for war crimes and taken to The Hague. I um, just experienced many different things, documenting ethnic cleansing. I was put on a death list. I was taken prisoner. There's various different things, documenting the, being one of the first photographers to document the prison camps. The frustration of people not reacting to the work, uh, the understanding of photography kind of taking on that other life of its own, uh, all, all kind of experiences and life lessons within, within that conflict. My second uh, pair of words, uh, Tony Vaccaro. Uh, Tony, you know, I think I like the, his quote about uh, blind luck and red wine. I think, uh, you know, there's without question this idea about being in the right place at the right time sometimes is not have anything to do with your skills. It was just completely, you're just lucky to, to be there. And then it's up to you to be able to kind of execute that. You know, the work that he did in, in World War II, I think is an attribution to that. And also the, you know, if I'm lucky enough to live, uh, he's now I think, 98 years old. He just survived COVID. Um, if I can get even to a little bit close to that, uh, in terms of uh, lifespan and working as a photographer, I'd be very lucky. Thank you. We have some videos on the channel about Tony and his lost roles. Um, what, what if I say Kabul? Well, I mean, Kabul today, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really heartbroken that I wasn't able to, to be there to, to document this transition. I was there uh, in 2001 uh, with the Northern Alliance when, when the Taliban fled and did a number of trips to, to Afghanistan after that. Um, I did one of the first digital monographs, if not the first digital photography monograph books called The Road to Kabul, uh, about my experience um, in the fall of Kabul. And so it's a place that uh, will always remain close to my heart. What if I say uh, Chris Morris? Uh, Chris Morris is a, is a colleague, is a co-founder, along with myself of the Seven Photo Agency. Chris is the one who gave me my plane ticket to go to Panama, was an incredible mentor for me in the beginning of my career. And I think remains today as probably one of the best photographers in the world. <laughs> what if I say fear? I think, as I mentioned earlier, fear is, is a constant partner. I think in these situations, it's important to recognize fear, know how to handle it. But also, I think for myself, every time I'm about to go somewhere for the first time, I'm a little bit fearful. So I have to kind of cross, force myself to cross that line. And then when I arrive, I'm like, well, what was I scared about? I'm glad I'm here. And the last question, uh, it's COVID. You know, COVID uh, obviously has affected the whole world. It's been incredibly um, impactful on working as a photographer. It's been impactful for me and my father. I lost my father uh, from COVID in 2020. I'm documenting what happened with him as long as well as what happened in New York City was uh, and continues to be, you know, a very emotional experience. Thank you, Ron. And uh, well, this interview is coming to, to an end. Um, but we have a tradition. I always ask our guests to take my saying, you know, always close my video saying never stop dreaming. That's kind of my signature everywhere. Uh, would you take that message, make it yours and invite our audience to dream? Uh, what, what would you tell whoever is watching in connection to the idea of never stop dreaming? I think without question, never stop dreaming. We see what can happen in the world, how it can change in a moment and how it's up to you to kind of take yourself and your life to the next step to what you really want and so many people are doing that they've kind of gotten a second chance uh where we are today and so i would say you know never stop dreaming and try to get and make your life what you want it to be it's been a pleasure ron thank you for finding the time to to do this interview my pleasure thank you